and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in your sight, my Lord and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you and those online joining us today. Wonderful to have you with us. Have you ever given advice only to turn around in the next breath and realize you've broken the advice you've just given? It seems, on face value, this is what's happened with Jesus, of all people today, as we move from what we heard last week in this journey of Mark to today's interaction with what's called the Syrophoenician woman. If we recall last week, Jesus was being challenged by the Pharisees about the disciples, did they wash their hands or not wash their hands before they ate, and did they break the law, and what really would defile them? And Jesus said, it's not what we put into our mouths, it's what comes out of our mouth that defiles us and makes us unclean. For from within a man or woman's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, I mean, he goes through the whole list. And all of these evil come from inside to make a person unclean. So Jesus left that place, and he goes to this vicinity called Tyre. Tyre is up north. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's Gentile territory. So he is out of his Jewish Hebrew area into Gentile land. And as he entered the house and did not want anybody to know that he was there, still the word got out. Brothers and sisters, when God's activity is present and active, when Jesus is moving through the Spirit, The word gets out. The community hears that something different is taking place. And so, in fact, as soon as they heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrophoenicia. So not only does this tell us location and geography and political affiliation and relationships, It's a small foreshadowing that the word of God that is to go forth to the Jews first eventually does go to the Gentiles and to us, or we would not have received it and be doing church today. And so she begs Jesus to drive the demon from her daughter, and Jesus responds in this really kind of nasty way. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Ladies, how would you respond to that comment? Who are you calling dog, boy? Oh, come on, ladies. <laughs> I know some of you in here are quite spirited. It's not going to happen. But does she respond in like? Does she throw jabs back at Jesus? No, because her heart is for her daughter. She is living humbly sacrificially, as most of us would for our own children, wouldn't we? To extend that, to put ourselves aside so that our children and our grandchildren would be made well. So this very brash comment, again, something that comes out of Jesus, showing a bit of issue that they had between the Jews and the Gentiles. She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. I think there was a moment there that even convicted Jesus. But then he said, for such as a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter, which also shows us Jesus didn't have to be in proximity to do that. His divinity, his presence, his power is global, is universal. It is that it is. And he was able to cast out that demon, recognizing the humility, the love, and the grace that this woman showed for the care for her daughter. And then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left you. And she went home and found the child lying in the bed. The demon had gone. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the armor of God as found in the book of Ephesians. And part of that armor is the breastplate of righteousness. And we talked briefly about the difference between righteousness and self-righteousness, which unfortunately gives righteousness a bad name. 
Again, meaning just living a right way according to the Lord. And the reason it's your blessed pray, because that's one of the most important, it, it protects your core of your body. If we are living a right way, if we have nothing to hide, then as slings and arrows come our way, we can then stand on our own character. We can then stand on truth, and we have no concern of what but people say about us, what arrows and barbs are thrown at us, because we are trying to live humbly and righteous and right before the Lord. But on the other side of that, we all have a tendency to fall into self-righteousness said all of this conversation that Jesus has had with this woman should lead us to wonder what are some of the ways we can be self-righteous without even knowing it. After all, self-righteousness wears many disguises. The scary thing about self-righteousness is that we usually don't recognize it in ourselves. We think because we're religious practices that we're okay with God. We think because we pray that we're trusting in Him and not ourselves. We think because we have uh, we live that uh, what we're doing is better than the people around us Self-righteousness can actually smell pretty bad John Maxwell the writer tells a funny story about a grandpa visiting his grandchildren in the afternoon Grandpa would take a nap. Don't we love naps aren't naps great? One day the children decided to play a choke on grandpa and as he was sleeping They took some Limburger cheese and mushed it into his mustache when he woke up, he started sniffing around. This room stinks. He gets up, he goes to the kitchen. Stinks in here, too. Finally goes outside to get some fresh air. The whole world stinks, he says. What's going on? It's kind of the way a self-righteous person can be. They can sure sniff out the sins and shortcomings of everybody around them, but they have a hard time seeing it in themselves. Jesus used a parable and an example of a Pharisee and a tax collector as the Pharisee is standing on the corner of the temple in front of everybody to see, oh, Lord God, look at me. I'm praying well. I'm a good man. I live according to your word. Oh, this tax collector, what a horrible person. I'll get to heaven before they do. I mean, he just keeps spouting on and spouting on. And finally, Jesus says, I hate to tell you, this tax collector in his humility will get to the kingdom before this Pharisee gets there because of his pride that blinds him. Sometimes we prayed, parade our good works around before God and before others, thinking that these good works will increase our stature, our theological position. And when we're called on them, instead of recognizing our self-righteous spirit, we recoil from the accusation and justify ourselves. But even when our self-righteousness is cloaked in words of gratitude or manifested in actions, on the surface, it appears to be done out of the desire for God's glory, but self-righteousness is still self-justification. It's misplaced trust that leads to misplaced judgment. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector kind of gives us a good, vivid portrait of pride versus humility, of justification by works instead of justification by faith. Theologian Daryl Block lays it out this way. Pride preaches merit. Humility pleads for compassion. Pride negotiates as an equal. Humility approaches in need. Pride separates by putting down others. Humility identifies with others, recognizing we all have the same need. Pride destroys through its alienating self-service. Humility opens doors with its power to sympathize with the struggle we all share. Pride turns up its nose. Humility offers an open and uplifted hand. See, this passage also reminds those of us in authority, in leadership in our household, how to actually lose an argument. Don't you hate losing an argument? When Jesus recognized in the woman's argument is actually stronger than his own. When her position of humility reveals his prejudice, he grants her petition. He recognizes it quickly instead of going to self-justification. Many of us don't have so much graciousness, unfortunately. 
Even when we know that the other person is right, we will go toe to toe to make sure that we hold the course, that we win the argument. We may try to justify ourselves rather than agree and just get on with the business at hand. Self-justification is a slippery slope. We've all had moments like this, moments where we feel cornered, moments where we feel overwhelmed, moments where we feel trapped in our own argumentative prison of our own making. We end up relying too much on uh, ourselves and not on the mercy of God, on the humility of God. And so we self-preserve using self-justification because we trust ourselves and our own understanding more than God. Perhaps we need to listen more closely to Proverbs 3 that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. The book of James underscores this today. We will be listening from the book of James for the next couple weeks. It's the last book included in the canon of Scripture because it wasn't quite gospel-centered, but it actually applies life and faith to what we do in a practical way. So I think everyone should read the book of James at least once a year. So in chapter 2, he's talking about favoritism forbidden within the community of the faith. Remember, they're still getting to know one another. We were talking about this today in the Rector's Forum. What does it look like to be a fellowship of faith? All of us come from different backgrounds, different histories, different theological practices, but when we join a community of faith, we should be under one banner for one purpose, no matter our differences. And so James reminds us, and this is the brother of Jesus, my brothers and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the person wearing the fine clothes and say, please sit here, and the poor man, you sit over here away at our feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who he loved. But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? It is not those who are dragging you into court. And he goes on and on. And again, the issue isn't about being rich or poor. It's about our hearts. It's about our attitudes. It's about how we look with grace, with love, with redemption, with care on all people in our community. Try to reach out. Again, each one of us in this church right now, and those of you watching online that are parts of the Church of the Ascension, you are living billboards and testimony to this parish. And in every interaction you have with people who belong to this church and people who don't, we share that message, are you welcomed or aren't you? Would you be received well or not? We, again, are windows to those who don't know Christianity and so he continues to say the difference between faith and deeds. We can say we believe, we can do all this stuff, but if we don't live it out in action, if we don't extend mercy and love and forgiveness and compassion to one another, we're missing how we're being fed by word and by table. So then what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? But if you have faith and I have deeds, show me that faith without deeds, and I will show you a faith that is dead. We are called to come in together as the body of Christ. We are called every Sunday to be recharged and renewed again by word and by sacrament, by fellowship, and by the prayers of the people that we pray for one another daily, and that we are equipped to do the work we do here out into the world. That's what it's about. So go into the world and feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit prisoners and captives, love your neighbor as yourself, and love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. For on these two commandments hangs all the law, the prophets, and the church.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.